Uh, well, I'm Jack Nelson, the former Washington Bureau Chief of the Los Angeles Times. Uh, I've covered every president since Richard Nixon. Uh, this is the most secretive president uh, I've ever uh, encountered. Uh, I've been w I was with the LA Times for 36 years, uh, uh, and uh, I recently uh, was at Harvard under a Sh Shorenstein Fellowship, and I did a long paper on government secrecy, uh, of which there's an awful lot today. Okay, and um, what is involved in being a, a bureau chief uh, in Washington? What is that? Well, in my case, uh, there are different kinds of bureau chiefs, but particularly on large newspapers, uh, which have a large Washington bureau, there are not very many, New York Times, Chicago Tribune, uh, LA Times, uh, and Boston Globe, a few others. Some of the bureau chiefs are largely administrative. I was a writing bureau chief, so while I oversaw the, the whole product of the, of the bureau, I actually was writing. I was covering the White House and covering uh, national security, other issues. So on any given day, you have a, a lot of stories coming in. How do you determine what to cover and what not to cover? Well, you determine on the basis of what's really important and what you think, uh, not people just what they want to know, but what they need to know about what the government's doing. And uh, of course, as bureau chief, I oversaw that, but also had uh, uh, editors in the bureau who were responsible for assigning reporters. Okay. And um, what, how do you uh, approach something that, if something kind of flies underneath the radar for a little bit, but it's, it's um, important but not interesting, you know, it, you know for example, um, Hussein Kamal was a defector that defected from, uh, from Iraq and he had a lot of information that Newsweek came out with an article on February 24th, but it wasn't picked up by any other of the um, New York Times, Washington Post, and then it trickled down and not being covered. So can you talk about kind of the hierarchy of information flow if someone else breaks a story? Yeah, well what happens is uh, that there are certain newspapers that sort of set the agenda of what, what is really big news in the, in the United States. Uh, the New York Times is number one. If they play it and play it big, almost everybody picks it up. The Washington Post is another one. The LA Times also, because it's a large newspaper and it helps set the agenda, but I'd say that that uh, barring those three papers, uh, the Wall Street Journal as well, uh, newspapers don't usually, aren't able to set the agenda unless it's one of those papers. So, you can't make out those uh, phony pictures of uh, Michael Dukakis and, and uh, no, Jesse think, Jackson, no. can you? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. No. Okay. Um, so, um, another question I have is, let's say someone that's not an agenda setting um, outlet like the Newsweek, mm -hmm. um, how do they get about getting other people to cover a story that's an important story? In other words, how does Newsweek itself promote that story? Right. Well, it does it by calling other newsmen, other bureau chiefs, bringing it to their attention, bringing it to the attention of the Associated Press. Uh, and, uh, and that's part of what bureau chiefs uh, often do, too. Uh, if you have a really big story uh, in your bureau and nobody else have is, have, has it, it's an exclusive, you try to find a ways that uh, other people find out about it. Right. So you would get a call from Newsweek and then they would say, Yes, exactly. Right about this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, uh, another thing about what I'm doing here that I didn't explain, I guess, is I'm going to uh, cut out my voice as a questioner. Right, so, right. Um, so I guess if I ask you that again, and, sure. Um, just put that in your words. Like, what, uh, specifically about the process when. Oh, I see what you're talking about. Yeah. Right. You, want, you, want me to you want me to incorporate right. the question so in a way. If I, okay. if I, I may stop uh, you and say. I got you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, specifically, uh, talk about the process that would happen if Newsweek would call you. Uh, well, what happens is, in, in Washington particularly, if you have an exclusive story, whether it's Newsweek or Time, New York Times, LA Times, and nobody else has it, you want to make sure it gets around. So you probably let other reporters know or other bureaus know that you've got that story coming. You let, certainly let the uh, networks know that it's coming, and you'll let the Associated Press know. And uh, if it's a big enough story, frequently they will pick up on it. Okay, good. Um, let's see. Um, now, how do you uh, approach institutions that usually have a big wall of secrecy, like the CIA or the 
uh, State Department and the Pentagon? Well, uh, when, you, when you run into secrecy in Washington, and of course you run into it at, at every level, not just the CIA, you can run into it at the Education Department, and you can run it into it at the uh, um, uh, Housing and Urban Development Department. Any department of government has a certain amount of secrecy to it. So what you do is uh, uh, you first try to find people within the department who are willing to talk to you and, br and to uh, break some of that uh, secrecy. Uh, and you look at uh, people who used to be in that department, former officials, and, and talk to them. And you also talk to people on the Hill, uh, both staff members and senators and House members, uh, who maybe are on committees that oversee those departments. And uh, that, that way you frequently can penetrate the, the uh, walls of secrecy. So a lot of networking. Yes, and, and there's a lot of, well, the networks do that as well as, uh, as the newspapers. I mean, uh, networking physically. Oh, networking, yes. The networking uh, uh, is often done by uh, different uh, journalists in order to propel a story beyond what it started out as. So how do you, is it a, a process of going to cocktail parties, or how do you kind of develop those networks? Well, uh, most really successful reporters in Washington spend a lot of time in social occasions as well. Uh, because of the networking that goes on among journalists. Uh, for example, they do go to cock party, cocktail parties a lot. They'll go to panel discussions. They'll go to, they'll go to, to uh, hearings on Capitol Hill. Uh, they'll talk in the, in the Capitol corridors to uh, staff members and senators and members of the House. So there's sort of a constant conversation going on among journalists uh, and government officials. And talk a little bit about how um now more and more that government will use access to high-level officials as ways of, of uh, determining what questions are, are allowable and not allowable. For example, what happened to Hella Thomas on March 6th not being called on. Well, the thing about it is in, in, in dealing with government officials who are trying to set their own agenda and want to get their information out and nothing more is that all of them do it. There's no question about that. And I've covered every president since Richard Nixon. Uh, this president and his administration does it more than any other administration. Uh, uh, and what they do is they, they will, uh, uh, they'll find out if a reporter uh, is really interested in getting all of the facts or if they're just interested in access. And if they're just interested in access and you can just feed them whatever you want to feed them, they'll give them access. But if, but if they're interested in going beyond the, the information you're trying to put out, they'll shut you out. Uh, they won't return your telephone calls. They won't call on you at press conferences, as in the case of Helen Thomas. Helen Thomas made the mistake of uh, having said some critical things about this administration. And uh, so they quit dealing with her. Mm -hmm. um, so in other words, it's a, it's a flack. It's a way of, con of a sensor or filter. Yes, things. yes. It's exactly a filter that, that uh, they go through. No question about that. And uh, it's, it's not... Uh, it's not, of course, just this administration. It's all administrations that engage in that. It's just that this administration carries it farther than anybody I've ever seen. Uh, the, the, the fact of, um, of not, just, not just telling people uh, not to return telephone calls, uh, but uh, to withholding information that uh, is clearly public information from reporters who they feel may want to get all of the facts, not just what the administration wants to put out. So, um, have you been keeping abreast with the, the local news and being able to make assertions that possibly that they've been getting more and more reporters out there that aren't interested in getting all the facts? Or? Well, I don't, I don't think that there are more and more reporters out there who are not interested in getting all the facts. What I do think is that there are some cases of reporters, uh, particularly television reporters, particularly cable television reporters, uh, who have uh, actually an ideological bent. Fox News is a perfect example of it. I mean, you know, they can get interviews with administration officials nobody else can get. And why? Because they have a very pro-administration slant. There's no question about that. Okay. And um, why don't you talk a, a little bit about the dynamic that um, journalists must balance between maintaining that access and uh, getting um, leaks from 
um, public uh, officials the balance they must uh, choose between becoming a political pawn versus um, actually getting all the facts and serving the public interest? Well, there's no question about it, but the journalists have a hard time sometimes looking for a really good balance on being able to get leaks from government officials uh, and yet not just doing the government's bidding, not just floating something that the administration wants to float. Uh, for one thing, uh, reporters uh, who uh, uh, get leaks uh, need to look at the motive of the leaker. Uh, and if the motive is simply to get out uh, some uh, message from the administration without uh, further examination, then they need to, to uh, try to strike a balance and find somebody who, who will uh, uh, an opponent of the administration, for example, who will look at what that information is and uh, uh, either comment on it or help analyze it. So, the, so it's it's important for the reporter to do that. Otherwise, uh, uh, you could get any number of, of so-called exclusives uh, that really don't tell the whole story. Um, can you go through maybe some of the different uh, reasons why um, there are leaks of uh, yeah. information? Well, there, there are a number of reasons for leaks uh, by the government officials. Uh, some of them are government officials uh, who leak uh, strictly to get out the administration's uh, uh, message. There's no, uh, no question about that. Then there are some people within government who look at uh, what's going on and, uh, and they think maybe, uh, maybe this isn't exactly right. Maybe, uh, uh, maybe what the government is doing here, uh, the public should know about it and uh, the government is trying to shield it. So these people for really good uh, interest of public service will, will uh, leak information. Then of course you'll have, you'll have people uh, actually in the White House who don't have the president's attention, who will leak information to a reporter to get the president's attention. Or you'll have people in the White House who have it in for the defense secretary and they will leak something to, in other words, to, to cause a problem for the defense secretary. So you do have those kind of leaks as well. You may have somebody in the White House who doesn't like a particular senator. He'll leak something that may not reflect uh, admirably on this particular senator. So you have all of these different uh, uh, motives for, for leaking. And that's one of the things that reporters have to be careful about. They have to at least know something about why the leak is coming out and uh, what the motivation is and whether or not there's more to the story than just that leak. And one of the things I've also noticed is that when there's a leak, sometimes the motive is very unclear. Is it the journalist's job to make the motives of the leak clear, or, or is it...? Well, I, I think that a journalist, if he knows what the motive is and can afford to say what it is, in some cases he may not be able to afford to say what it is, maybe because of a confidential agreement with whoever is leaking the information. But I think wherever, wherever uh, possible, uh, that the reporter ought to try to make it clear that you know that if it's leaked by an enemy of the person uh, uh, who is uh, doesn't come out looking very good in this leaked information, then I think it should say it came came from an enemy or a critic of this particular person. So I think that's a that's a, a responsibility of the reporter. Okay, and um, I guess another. Um factor in this is anonymous sourcing and um, maintaining that balance of getting information that you can't source uh, versus uh, just for no reason uh, people not wanting to be named. Um, have you seen an increase in anonymous sourcing and how can that be exploited? Well, anonymous sourcing can be exploited by the administration simply by... Uh... Okay, let me um, take it from the top wherever Um, so, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll just ask the question again. Talking about anonymous sourcing, how can that, uh, do you see a trend of it being exploited a lot or um, when it's unnecessary? Well, I think what happens on anonymous sources is, and in this town, in Washington, I mean, you really do have to depend upon anonymous sources a lot. There's no question about that because there's so many people in government who would like to help you sometimes get information and for very good reasons, I mean, for healthy reasons. Uh, but they don't want to be identified because they don't want to, to lose their job or they don't want to be ostracized or some reason like that. So there are a lot of anonymous sources and, uh, and newspapers and news magazines uh, are frequently using them. 
Are there too many sometimes? Yes, I think sometimes there are too many. And as a matter of fact, there are so many used sometimes that I think that, that reporters occasionally will, will use an anonymous source when they could have used the source on the record because they think the story sounds like it's more exclusive, uh, more uh, exciting if they're quoting anonymous sources rather than somebody on the record. So I think it's exploited sometimes by, uh, by journalists. And of course it's exploited by people in government uh, frequently when they could be on the record, uh, but won't go on the record. So as a, a consumer of news, um, how do you assess like the, the motives of the leakers and also, you know, if... <laughs> so, um, I suppose, but I lost my train of thought. Yeah, what you asked too, but... The, uh, oh, as a consumer of news, how do you assess if there's an anonymous, should you, should a red flag go up if you see an anonymous source and you can see that, you know, anytime you hear an anonymous source and it's making big news? Um, well, I think as a consumer of news and somebody who has been involved in reporting the news over the years, I'll always look very carefully at a story that has anonymous sources and try to figure out, depending on what the story is, but trying to figure out who the sources really are and whether or not this information is solid. And uh, uh, I think it helps, of course, to have been on the end of reporting the news to be able to determine sometimes who those sources are. Uh, I think the average consumer has a very hard time when they see anonymous sources, a senior administration official somebody close to the, the president, it's hard for them to, to uh, understand who it might be. Okay. And um, another uh, point on, um, you know, spokesmen of these different uh, like CIA or State Department, um, do you find that sometimes that they try to protect the institution of the Pentagon or the CIA or the White House um, and, the, uh, and the personnel or uh, in the policy and kind of blend those together, you know, and uh, kind of stand up for the integrity of the CIA when, when someone did something wrong or... Um... Well, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's any question but that, that the spokesman at the various agencies... Okay, awesome. You can hear this? Yeah, I can hear it. You can okay. hear it downstairs too? I can, the mic picks up a lot. Oh, it does, so. huh? Yeah. I mean, just, you just wait till it stops ringing. Yeah, it stops ringing. Someone's trying to get <laughs> I can ask my wife to pick it up on the first ring or something. It's okay now. Okay. <laughs> you can answer All now. Right. Um, question again. Um, it's just talking about the, the spokesman and the. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that um, that most spokesmen for almost any agency within the within the government uh, considers his job protecting the agency, uh, protecting the people in the agency. However, there are spokesmen. Uh, and, and, and government, uh, who see their job as representing the public as well. And it depends upon uh, which spokesman you're talking about and which administration you're talking about. Uh, I think that uh, there are many cases where press secretaries uh, see that they have a duty to, certainly to be honest uh, in dealing with reporters. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there are some who have, um, who have flat out lied to reporters. Uh, and, uh, and, and some of them have lied, not know, or maybe not have not necessarily lied, but have given false information because they didn't know it was false. For example, I remember the case of Larry Speaks, press secretary to Ronald Reagan, giving out some false information on the uh, invasion of Grenada because he had been fed false information, and he later apologized for it. So I guess um, that's one of the um, defenses of this current administration is that if there was false information being fed to either Bush, then he's kind of pointing the finger at other people and saying, well, I don't know. And so they say, well, he didn't know he was lying. Well, the thing about uh, President Bush and this administration is that uh, the buck really does stop with the President of the United States. And so I don't think that, uh, that President Bush can say I was given false information. The fact is, he hasn't claimed that, I don't think. I mean, uh, so far they haven't claimed that. But uh, he obviously has passed on some false information. Right. Um, uh, I guess, uh, getting back to the, uh, oh, I'll go the, uh, uh, and do you see 
What is different between a beat reporter and more investigative journalism? Well, a beat reporter uh, really covers essentially whatever breaks on that particular beat, whether it's the Pentagon or the State Department or the White House. Well, an investigative reporter uh, normally can go uh, across any lines uh, and uh, is involved in trying to find out things that uh, uh, in almost every case people are trying to prevent him from finding out. And so he's really digging for information that, uh, that the government, somebody in the government is trying to keep the public from having. And uh, have you seen a decline on investigative journalism over time? Well, I've seen a decline in aggressive reporting, and I guess that comes into uh, a decline somewhat in investigative reporting. I think that's right. And, uh, and I think it's a sad case to see a decline in investigative reporting, but I think I have seen it. What do you attribute that to? Well, I'm really not sure, uh, but I think I think any time you have a, a president who's popular, there's not as much aggression on the part of the press, uh, unfortunately. But I think that's true. Um, looking at specifically at the uh, the buildup to the case of the war, there seemed to be some politicized intelligence, and then um, so the Democrats were kind of not really speaking out a lot on it, and so there weren't anybody making news. Yeah, I don't know. Did, do you have an assessment over, um, you know, could the media have been doing a better job at digging um, in the buildup to the war? Well, I don't think there's any question but that the, that the media could have done a much more aggressive job of trying to search out the facts when this administration was uh, beating the drums for war. Uh, and uh, the fact that the Democrats themselves seem to be shying away because of the popularity of the president in the aftermath of 9-11 uh, doesn't excuse, in my opinion, the press from not more aggressively pursuing uh, the story and uh, uh, being out in front a little more than they were. So you think if they would have been more aggressive, then it could have led to information that we have since found out that um, would have raised more red flags or helped stop it? I doubt that the press could have done anything that would have stopped this administration from going to war. They seem hell-bent on going to war. and. Uh, uh, so I, I doubt they could have stopped it, but I think that uh, they could have at least, uh, uh, they could have raised more questions in the minds of the public about what the administration was up to and what it was doing. Uh, and uh, uh, it's possible, it's possible if the public had, uh, uh, had uh, decided that uh, this was not a good thing to do and that uh, had, made it, uh, had made that clear, it's possible, I guess, that, uh, that President Bush might have seen it as not politically the thing to do, and maybe he wouldn't have done it. Uh, but he had uh, he had the public behind him because of 9/11, and uh, you know he wasn't going to be deterred. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, let's see. Um, I guess in the the build up to the war, there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of the coverage uh, surrounding the UN inspections and international law, and it seems to be a, a challenge to make something that doesn't seem to be that interesting but really significant for journalists to make that significant. Can you talk a little bit about how do you go about making something that's um, significant but instead of taking the Bush administration's interpretation of it, actually looking at other international opinions or um, nonprofit um, think tanks that are actually having a, a dissenting opinion? Well, I I think that in the case of, uh, of the build-up to going into Iraq, uh, there was not enough looking at the uh, critics of, of what was going on. There was not enough. There was not enough looking at history. There was not enough looking at what happened when we bombed Libya, for example. And uh, you know that didn't quote stop terrorism. That's what that was designed to do. And you could almost look at a lot of things that happened with with regard to Libya. Uh, and they apply to a, to Iraq today. I mean, you know, we went in and we bombed and we killed some civilians, uh, bombed the French embassies, uh, uh, and uh, we didn't wind up really stopping terrorism at all. Thank God we stopped short of invading, but uh, but uh, we didn't we didn't learn anything from it, obviously. So I, that's the a challenge that I see is that the history seems to be so dynamic if information is being declassified and information is coming out, 
you know, is it the journalist's responsibility to keep abreast on the history that is constantly changing and to incorporate that? Well, I do think that uh, the journalists have an, op you know, an obligation to put everything into historic context. Uh, and it's true that a lot of information is continually coming out, and I think sometimes that uh, the think tanks do look at this information. Uh, the reporters are inclined to not look at it until maybe the think tanks have already done it. Uh, they probably should be doing more of it. Yeah, can you talk about the uh, relationships between uh, the influence of the, um, the think tanks, um, especially that may have a, a conservative or liberal, liberal um, mindset? You know, how do you, as a bureau chief, kind of look at all the information that's coming in and kind of weight it accordingly? Well, of course, when information comes in from a think tank, you look at its, uh, uh, its orientation, and if it is the Heritage Foundation, of course, you know it's very conservative. Uh, if, it's, uh, if it's Brookings, uh, it's more, I would say, you know, down the center rather than, than liberal, but at least uh, uh, get you get it again, yeah. again, huh? <laughs> You'll be able to use it. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. This would have happened in any room in the house, by the way. So. Yeah. Okay, so uh, from the top, when you get information in from the think tank, how do you... Well, when you get information from the think tank, you usually look at the think tank's orientation itself. If, if it's the Heritage Foundation, for example, I mean, you, you know good and well that it's, that it's a, a very conservative viewpoint on almost everything they do. If it's a Brookings institution, it's probably uh, maybe a little left-leaning, but more to the center and uh, more likely to get uh, somewhat of a balanced view. But, but you have to uh, take that into consideration when you're reporting whatever their findings are. So you have to look for the other part of it and bring some, some balance to whatever report they issue. So talk a little bit about the differences between editorial writers who may have more freedom to um, incorporate um, history um, versus regular beat reporters or investigative reporters and how they incorporate history. Well, of course, editorial writers have a different uh, uh, job entirely. Their job is to reach some sort of conclusion about uh, issues and about events and to make some sort of judgment on it. Uh, they're not any freer, in my opinion, uh, than reporters of the news to include historic context and probably should because there should be a lot of analytical reporting. And uh, when you bring it into historic context, you, uh, in context, you're frequently doing some analysis, and that's what uh, the best reporting uh, 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 involves. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Um, talk a little bit about the um, kind of the competitive aspects of um, kind of the lust to get it first um, versus the lust to get it right. You know, if you get an exclusive, they're there seems to be pressure to get it out there as soon as you can. Well, there's always a rush to get the story first, to be first out there and to have people have to quote you maybe in other papers, on television or whatever. And sometimes that goes too far. There's no question about that. I mean, I remember a specific example back during the Vietnam War. Uh, I had a story about uh, the uh, FBI using some some uh, agent provocateurs in connection with some cases involving the Vietnam veterans against the war. And uh, the New York Times was about to beat me on the story, I thought. And I called up and talked to our national editor and he said, I said, I don't have it quite dead, but I got enough of it. I think we better go with it before the New York Times beat us. And he says, be second, but be right. And I think he was right about that. Most responsible editors and I thought of myself as a responsible reporter, although my editor helped me be responsible, believe you got to have it right. And, you know, you'd like to get it first, but you got to have it right first. But there is that thirst for being first. And sometimes uh, I think it, uh, it outweighs uh, being right, which is, uh, which is bad. What happens, um, how do you approach uh, when you're second, you know, when, when the... Uh the first, uh, like the New York Times will break a story. Um, how do you go about trying to cover it? Do you, I guess it, it depends on the situation, but sometimes stories will be ignored. Is that a phenomenon that happens? 
Because they, they well, yeah, it is true that some newspapers will ignore a story uh, if somebody else has broken it first. Uh, I don't think that your major newspapers normally will do that, though. If they've been working on the story, they'll run the story themselves and try to bring in an extra dimension to it or something, but not actually ignore it. What does happen sometimes, though, is that if a, if a newspaper has an exclusive story and they break it and the other papers are not working on it, unless it's just really compelling, they may do their best to ignore it. It's hard to ignore it if it's in the New York Times. Very hard to ignore it. And it's often hard to ignore it if it's in the Washington Post and the LA Times. <clears throat> One reason being that it'll go on the LA Times Washington Post news service, which will go to 300 other papers in this country with about a 25 million circulation and another 200 million overseas, uh, 200 papers with another 20 million overseas. So it's hard to ignore it if it comes out of one of the major publications. Can you uh, talk a little bit about the dynamic between the, um, the print news media that has a different deadline and news cycle versus the evening news that, um, that may have their um, deadlines later on in the evening where something would happen to the day? You know, how, how do those two interrelate? Like, do, do is someone... Uh, do you see an influence of the print media on what, cover, what is covered in the evening news? Well, there's absolutely no question but that what the, what the print media covers sort of sets the agenda. Once again, the New York Times above all, but the New York Times, uh, the Washington Post, and in some cases the LA Times, although the three-hour time differential from LA makes a difference. But nevertheless, it's what the major media does because, let's face it, the major newspapers put so much more manpower into covering the news than the networks do. I mean, for example, the LA Times Washington Bureau now has about 58 people in it. 58 people. I mean, that's larger than, than the, uh, uh, than the uh, Washington bureaus of ABC, NBC, and CBS put together. And so they're out there covering the news much more so uh, than the networks are. And so a lot of what happens uh, uh, of the news that comes out on, on the evening news comes out because of what's happened in the print media. Hmm. So I guess, um, how, how, how many people do you know, uh, or can you say that the LA Times would reach? Um, because I know that the, uh, the Nielsen ratings, if you look at that, there may be 30 million people that ABC, CBS, and NBC are reaching. That's true. Well, the evening news of the three major networks, ABC, NBC, and CBS, still reach a huge number of people, not nearly as many as they used to because of cable television and everything else, but they still reach a huge number of people. The only reason the LA Times and the Washington Post may reach a very huge audience too, maybe like 20 million, is that they have this LA Times Washington Post news service. New York Times is the same way. The New York Times, of course, is a major paper and based in New York where the networks are located, where the Associated Press has a big presence and everything, that makes a difference too. But uh, the New York Times also has a news service, and that news service goes to hundreds of papers all over the country. So that's the reason that, uh, that the major papers also have a big impact on, on, on what happens. Although, it's still true that most people get their news, most people, from uh, television. Um, uh, what if, uh, if the government is telling you, uh, if they're saying this event is being caused by these factors, what, what kind of process can you go through to kind of analyze what other factors may be actually causing that instead of what the government is, is saying? Uh, how do you go about it? Well, it, 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 if, if the government, that is, if the executive branch, if the White House or the Defense Department or the State Department or what have you tells you that certain things are true about uh, what's happening uh, and you don't necessarily take their word for it, you go to Capitol Hill. Uh, you talk to the members of the committee that may oversee this particular department. You ask them what's the truth of this. Uh, you go to uh, uh, opponents of the government uh, and ask them about it. So uh, there are ways of finding out whether or not the government's giving you the whole story, but it's, it's a tough job. It's a very difficult job. Let's face it, the government has a huge information apparatus. I mean, if you took 
if you took all of the news bureaus uh, in, in Washington, D.C., and put, put all their manpower together, it wouldn't equal what the government has in the way of information specialists, press secretaries, uh, you know, spinmeisters, as they call them, other people who are trying to feed what the government uh, view is. And so the only, the, the, the only view that the American people can get, other than the government's own view of what it's doing, comes from the media. Well, and from Congress, if it's Congress looking at what the executive branch is doing. But again, if you want to know what's going on in Congress, the only view you can get other than from Congress is the media. So the media really is the public's representative in finding out what the government's doing, both uh, in the judiciary, in the legislative, and in the executive branch. There's no question about that. It is the fourth estate. Um, one thing that comes to mind is a lot of people who are um, either pro-war or um, conservatives, Republicans, will say that there's a liberal bias in the media, and they'll kind of... Uh, discount a lot of what they say. Do you see that there's a liberal bias or do you see that it might be a conservative bias or attributed to other factors? I don't think there's any bias whatever in the media. There is bias in certain aspects of the media. The media in general, I mean if you're talking about the major newspapers, you're talking about the major networks, I'd say no media bias. If you're talking about Fox News, very conservative without any question. If you're talking about a lot of the cable television news, extremely conservative. Uh, if you're talking about some of the talk radio people like Rush Limbaugh and others, I mean, there's no question about it. They're overtly uh, uh, conservative and, and not, that, not just that, but in many instances, real demagogues. But uh, it's a sham that they put on the American uh, public uh, and I guess convinced a lot of people it's so. But I mean, you look at the columnists in this country. Who are the big columnists in this country? George Will, who screams about the media bias. Charles Krauthammer, who screams, screams about the media bias. William Sapphire, who screams about the media's bias. All of these big name columnists that have these huge audiences out there, like they're not part of the media. And so if there's any media bias at all, I'd say it's on the conservative side. Hmm. So um, on any given day, um, when you were the... Bob Novak. I had one time, one, one, time I, one time I actually faced off with Bob Novak on that very question, is there a media bias? And then he stood up there as a real conservative, claiming there was a, there was a liberal bias. Unbelievable. <laughs> Unbelievable. So on, uh, if you were to go in, uh, on an ordinary day as a bureau chief, uh, what time would you get into work and how would you get your news for the day to know what to do? For the rest of the day. Well, to begin with, uh, I'd get up in the morning and uh, I'd read the uh, New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, uh, the uh, Washington Post. Uh, for a while there, I was reading the uh, Washington uh, Evening Star, in the afternoon at least. Uh, and uh, and uh, so I read all of those papers. Uh, uh, I get up and I make telephone calls. Uh, I talk to other people in the bureau. And uh, around, of course, I worked for a, a, a West Coast newspaper, the Los Angeles Times. Our editors wouldn't get to work until about three or four hours after we did because of the time differential. And by the time they, uh, they, they got in contact with us, we already pretty well knew what we would be doing for the day. So that uh, there was not a lot of assigning of things from Los Angeles. Most of the assignments originated in Washington. Hmm. Interesting. Um, let's see. Now, what about uh, government sources of information? Do you, uh, what do you look at of the documents that are coming out of the, the government? Uh, well, the government documents that come out uh, are, are, we don't get a lot of just routine government uh, uh, documents coming out other than press releases, which usually are not uh, of much value to us. Uh, most of the government documents that we deal in are documents that you may go looking for when you're in, involved in some particular story. But what you do do uh, in the morning is you start calling sources right away. Uh, people, some of them you just call up blind. You say, what's going on today? Like you, if you're at a local newspaper calling up City Hall and ask somebody what's going on. So some of it is just blind. Otherwise, you're calling up and you're asking about particular uh, issues. Um, so what about the uh, congressional record or something that what Congress is doing proceedings? I guess if that, do you pay attention to that 
if you're well, we don't. We, yes, we don't pay a lot of attention to the congressional record because the congressional record is something that's already happened, and we've had people there watching what's happening day in and day out. So we know what's going on in Congress on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not that it, when an issue comes up, sometimes we'll go back and check on it to, to uh, again, to put it into some sort of context. But uh, as far as the breaking news is concerned, we don't use the congressional record because by the time it comes out, it's not news. We've already had somebody covering that. Um, it, it's hard to say that you see a lot of documents on a routine basis, government documents on a routine basis. You have to be looking for something. And, uh, uh, and then, of course, and frequently, of course, uh, you'll find resistance to letting you have documents. And sometimes you have to use the Freedom of Information Act to get the documents. It depends upon what it is. How do you um, evaluate the, the media's performance um, leading up to the war in Iraq? Well, I don't think the media uh, was uh, was aggressive enough in, in reporting uh, on events that led up to the uh, uh, Iraqi war. I mean, to, for example, I give you a very good example. When I was at Harvard University on the Shortstein Fellowship, back when the, the, they were leading up to the war, I was there from uh, September th uh, into December. We had a Shorenstein fellow there by the name of William Lambert, who was a retired editor of the Financial Times. While we were there, he went over to an off-the-record meeting in London. And at this off-the-record meeting, it was attended about, by about 50 or 60 people, including a lot of big celebrities, including some celebrity names from here in the United States. A Mideast expert, so-called expert, from the Defense Department spoke. And he told them they were not only going into Iraq, he said, and they will be cheering, cheering us when they're liberated. And people in Iran and, and Syria, they'll be next because they'll be holding up their arms and saying, liberate us too. So this was going on. I, I mentioned when Lambert came back and told me that, he said it was off the record. I said, well, look, if there were 50 or 60 people in there, how can it be off the record? And somebody needs to write about this. Well, he hadn't thought too much about that, but he decided that I was right. And he actually wrote something about it in the Financial Times. I hate to say this, but I called up my own paper, the LA Times, and they never followed up on it. And neither did anybody else. And no story was ever written on this. And yet an official of the Defense Department was over in London telling these people that, yes, we were going into Iraq, and after we, quote, liberated Iraq, people would be cheering, and they would be cheering in Syria and Iran, too, because that's where we'd go next. Now that was a story in my opinion, but it wasn't followed up. So you think that the decision was already made to uh, to go to war then? Um, so, so the well, my, my guess would be that the decision was already made. He certainly indicated it was, this defense official. Hmm. So how do you see the uh, dynamic between international press, like if the story breaks overseas and um, the New York Times that are they paying are is if the New York Times is the agenda setting institution are they paying attention to all these other stories as well or how do you how do you do that at the LA Times if you're not without? you mean is the lost is the New York Times paying attention to the international press and what they're reporting uh, no, I don't think that the New York Times or the LA Times or the rest of the press is paying that much attention to what's being written overseas because for, for one thing, uh, the, uh, the Economist and other publications in, uh, in uh, London uh, have been much more aggressive in reporting what's going on uh, in uh, Iraq and what, what led up to the war and everything else than, than the American press has been. Uh, you can look at BBC, BBC, which now has a program running here, you know, on uh, public television. Um, I frequently look at them before I look at our own networks because they have things that, uh, about uh, the whole situation in Iraq that our own networks don't have sometimes. Okay. Um, let's see. All right. So, um, let me move on to... And, uh, let me say one other thing. Okay, go ahead. If you want to know about secrecy in this, in, in, in this country, and secrecy in this government, don't look for the press to cover it because they don't cover it very much. You know where you find it? You find it online. You go online and you go on to the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, and you go on there on the Federation of American Scientists, and it has this 
a secrecy project that Steve Aftergood puts out several times a week. I get it at my computer right there. Several times a week they have bulletins on all of the secrecy that's going on in this country. But the, but the press is hardly covering it at all. I can't really tell you why that is, but the press hardly covers it at all. Yeah, I'm on, I read Steve's uh, side every day. I'm astounded. I'm astounded at the, the lack of coverage we get. Steve Aftergood thinks that most reporters ought to have a, a, a beat reporter covering government secrecy, and I don't know but what, particularly with this administration, he's not right about that. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, I was going to move on to the, the secrecy and kind of focus more on the um, um, getting some sound bites um, that could be used in a 30 second film as opposed to a, uh, okay. to a longer um, project of the echo chamber. So uh, why don't you uh, talk about you know, how Bush compares historically with secrecy? Well, like I say, I've covered every administration from Richard Nixon, who was very secretive. I covered the first George Bush, George H. W. Bush, and uh, he was secretive. He was a former CIA director, uh, and uh, nobody equals George W. Bush. He's more than a chip off the old block. I mean, uh, his administration, from the outset, before 9-11, was extremely secretive uh, on the whole energy task force that, uh, that uh, uh, Cheney set up, for example. To this day, they have not told us who helped in the uh, energy industry uh, draw their plan up. Uh, uh, Ashcroft, the Attorney General, most secretive Attorney General I've ever known of. Uh, uh, and of course, since 9-11, since 9-11, they have used uh, uh, the fact of the uh, terrorist attack to justify all kinds of secrecy, and including uh, holding people incommunicado for years, uh, including ar ar arresting American citizens, uh, declare them a, a, an enemy combatant, denying them access to a lawyer, denying the press any uh, access at all to who, what's been happening to any of these people. Uh, so this administration, as far as I'm concerned, is by far the worst uh, that I know anything about. Hmm. Okay, um, I'm going to ask you the, the, the question again, and uh, maybe in uh, ten seconds uh, summarize that you've covered these presidents, and from what I've seen, this is the most secretive president in history. Okay. Well, I've covered every president since Richard Nixon, and uh, George H. W. Bush. I covered him. He was very secretive. Uh, former CIA director, of course, and his son, George W. Bush, uh, is more than a chip off the old block. I mean, he is really super secretive and uh, the, the most uh, I've had any experience with. Okay. And how does that secrecy affect democracy? Well, it means what's happening is the government uh, uh, is doing a lot of things that the public has no idea what they're doing. Uh, uh, they're being denied the uh, information they, they need to make. Uh, intelligent decisions uh, down the road. Uh, he's running for re-election. Uh, uh, the, the government's doing things we have absolutely no knowledge of. And so, to me, that's, uh, uh, that's just a moral on democracy. Hmm. Okay. And... Say one more time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, um, one more time. The, um, just the... And maybe just go uh, straight from Nixon to Bush and talk about um, how he compares to, you know, just because I think people, when they think of secrecy, this, if this isn't a, a political ad, it's going to be to people um, who, who are going to know, you know, Nixon's secret. And um, coming from an expert source, you know, that you've covered these people. So, so I don't need to say that uh, uh, cover them all. Yeah, just, well, oh. specifically go straight from Nixon's to... Uh, to current Bush. To, to current Bush, okay. Right. okay. Well, I've covered every uh, president since Richard Nixon who was very secretive, but this administration, this president is more secretive than any I've ever known anything about. Hmm. Okay, that's great. And um, maybe talk a little bit about um, the keeping secrets from Congress and how that affects well, it's not, it's not just that this administration keeps secrets from the press and the general public, it keeps them from, from Congress. You have Republicans as well as Democrats in Congress uh, who have been complaining bitterly about the fact that they are denied access to information that they're entitled to see, just as the public's being denied access to information they're entitled to see. Okay. 
Um, let's see, how does Bush use secrecy um, politically? Well, Bush uses secrecy to keep uh, from embarrassing his own administration without any question. I mean, the things this administration's been doing that he's not proud of, that's pretty obvious. Uh, he, he uses it to justify the, the uh, uh, invasion of Iraq. He uses it to justify the defense buildup. Uh, he uses it to justify just about everything he does. Ask uh, President Bush any question, what would you ask him? Well, that's a pretty, that's a pretty tough question to, to decide on. There's so many different questions you could ask him. I looked down and saw, what are you trying to hide, Mr. President, and thought, hmm, well, Well, that wouldn't get an answer, though, of any kind. I mean, yeah. I think I think if I had if, if if I did have one question I had to ask President Bush, though, I'd ask him, "Isn't the American aren't the American people aren't the American people entitled to know what the government is is doing about?" not only what's going on in Iraq, but what's going on down at Guantanamo Bay where we're holding hundreds of these people in communicado with no access to a lawyer, no access to the press. Isn't the public entitled to know that? Okay, can you ask that uh, just uh, one more time? That's good. I just wanted to get it. Um, so, say that again? Uh, yeah, just because, yeah, you kind of thought through what you're going to oh, say. Oh, okay, all right. Well, if I, could ask, if I could ask President Bush one question, I think I'd ask him, aren't the American people entitled to know not only what the government really is doing in Iraq, but what the government is doing down in Guantanamo Bay and what's happening to those hundreds of prisoners that are kept down there incommunicado without access to a lawyer, without access to the press or anybody in the public. Okay. And let's see if there's any other questions. Um, I guess uh, when you're uh, would you describe journalism as a discipline of, of verification, and how does that? How do you verify the information that you're, you're getting? Say, say that again. Uh, would you describe journalism as kind of a discipline of verification, like verifying the info that you're you're getting, uh, independently verifying instead of just taking the word for it? Describe how you do verify. You say. Yeah, I guess um, when you're getting someone telling you a piece of information, mm -hmm. a lot of times what. I see if ha has happened is that the journalists will just take that and kind of repeat it almost as if they're reporting it and they've right, seen it. Right, right, right. Well, I think any responsible journalist, when they get information from the government, whatever the government source, they look at it and, and they see if there are other ways to verify what's there. Uh, and if there is some uh, hidden agenda by the person who's releasing the information, but also uh, if there is an opposing viewpoint. Uh, to bring to it, so that uh, you don't just take what's handed out to you by the government uh, as being gospel. Otherwise, you're just being an extension of the public relations or propaganda apparatus. Or echo chamber. As right. Call it. Yeah. right. Um, okay. Uh, oh, one last question. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that the, the consolidation of the, the news organizations, how has that affected the flow of I guess this is more from the standpoint of TV media more so than print media. Uh, as far as uh, eliminating diverse voices, um, there seems to be a lot of... Uh, now, if you want to get an uh, alternative opinion, it seems like you have to resort to uh, PBS or uh, programs on there as opposed to the major uh, news networks covering information. Have you seen that pattern? I don't know that I, I don't know that I have a very good answer for that. Okay. Yeah. All right, that's fine. I guess I mean you're, you're kind of stuck in the, the print journalism world, well, and they don't see it as much, I guess, because the uh, New York Times is still kind of has that influence. Yeah. So, okay. Well, um, I think that's it. Okay. <laughs>